The following is a paid program, and the views expressed on this show do not represent the views of WJZ AM, Intercom Communications, its sponsors, or affiliates. This is Coons Ford Turf Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-41-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and a Turp Talk. What a pleasure last night that finally basketball came back, started. And it was a strange kind of game, but I, I like the effort. I wasn't happy about uh, tossing the lead away, but those things happen early in the year. And to talk of hoops with me, to talk everything Maryland with me, I got my two boys in the house today. And that, of course, is Wayne Viner and Mason Viner. Guys, welcome in for Turp Talk. I think it's been a while since you've both been in for Turp Talk. It, it has been. We split you come, but here or there. But here or there. And you have had us both on the Sports Maven at different times right. over the weekend. So yesterday I was uh, went to the game and I was somewhat wounded because I had a tooth pulled, uh, and uh, earlier in the day, not at the game. No, earlier in the day, and I, you know, my wife says I can't believe you're going to the game. I said I can't, I can't miss it. I cannot miss this game. You might think I'm nuts, but I really looked forward to it all day. And then it took me an hour and forty minutes to get there. You you weren't too happy when you oh. showed up. I left real early. I figure I talk with Mason, maybe eat with me, yeah. have dinner with Mason, and uh, hour and forty minutes. I don't know what time I got to leave to come anymore. Well, the games. It, it varies. You just don't know. Well, well, traffic. Yeah, that's going to be the discussion. Now I'm here. It's been bad the past few days. I mean, yeah, it's, it's dark. Seven it's o'clock. dark. The seven it's o'clock. Dark early, and people just get stuck in it. I, yeah. I took me an hour and ten minutes to drive five miles. I, I Bruce. All right, so I know that sometime soon in December, there's a Bruce Posner, we call a Bruce Posner special, which is the 5 p.m. start against somebody. You love those. Oh, yeah, they're just, well, it, it doesn't matter anymore because I'm retired. So I just, you know, I just go out there early. I'll meet you for lunch or Mason for lunch, and we'll hang around and uh, then go uh, to the game. Sure. Right. But let's talk hoops because that's a lot more important. And uh, since you guys are both here, I'd like to hear both of your opinions on on the game yesterday, what you liked, what you didn't like, and uh, we'll start with Mason. Uh, what, well, let's see. What I liked was Jalen Smith. I liked the scoring down low. I feel like that's something that Maryland basketball has lacked over the past few years as someone that can really put the ball on the floor down low and score. What I did not like was, and since since the post game show last night, I do agree with you. First game woes do happen. That stuff happens in your first game. What I didn't like is while Maryland did look stronger down low, they were still got some plays where guys were flying out of bounds, not boxing out. Those are things that really get to me is not boxing out. Like I remember a play when the game was really tight where Jalen Smith just didn't box out, just missed the guy, and the guy for Delaware comes in, grabs the rebound, puts the ball in the basket immediately. That that really gets to me, especially when the game's on the line. Okay, some of the things I saw. I thought number five for Delaware, last name Smith. Carter. 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 That, guy, that guy was good. Unbelievable. What do you have? 29 points. He was all over the place. It looks like he twisted an ankle and wasn't quite as effective down the stretch. He still played limping. <laughs> and he was still good. Uh, for Maryland, high points, I like the point guard play. I think Ayala looked fantastic as a point guard. He made some plays that Bruce and I elbow on each other, sitting there on press row going, Did you, that's how you play point guard at this level. Jalen Smith looked good for his minutes. Uh, 19 minutes from Bruno Fernando because he was in foul trouble. He had uh, more dunks than he's had in a while. He broke free. I think Delaware's a pretty good team. I think Delaware's going to cause some problems for their opponents down the road. Maryland is a little thin up front. Jalen Smith got thrown around a bit. He was spectacular. Nine, at one point, he was 19 points, 13 boards. I think he might end it up there. Uh, that that's a heck of a first game. Needs to be able to hang with the Big Ten size bodies. Maryland still, although they look really good at points last night, does not have that six eight, two hundred and sixty pound hybrid tight end rush end power forward that seems like Michigan State has four of them and and everybody else in the Big Ten. Purdue seems to have two or three of them. Everybody else has a guy that size that can play. Don't see that yet for Maryland. But, Bruce, you've been watching this longer than anybody else. What did you see? I was very impressed, and uh, I thought that uh, Bruno Fernando was totally dominant. I could not believe he only had four rebounds. It seemed like he had a lot more. Now, maybe I 
I, I don't know. I, you know, but, I didn't keep the stats, but, but uh, those um, those dunks make him look impactful. He had some beautiful dunks. That guy can play some ball. Yeah, look, at, look at our two bigs, Mason. We had uh, Jalen was eight for fifteen, and you know, watching him throw up these three point shots. Now I know he can hit them, but when you watch him inside, he's a magician, and you wonder why the preponderance to the three point shot. I mean, but that's the thing these well, days. Yes, these days. Um, you have to show that you can shoot the ball if you want to be an NBA draft pick. And Jalen Smith's a five-star guy. The bottom, the end of the day will be him going to the NBA. Maybe this year. Well, that's uh, maybe. Let next. me get to okay. it. Okay. Maybe this year. And obviously, if he can get to it, he's going to go. That is, that's just the nature of the game these days. A thing that I didn't like is Maryland has two backup point guards, and Anthony Cowan's still there for 33 minutes. Even when he's not playing well, yeah, he did not have the best of games yesterday. I mean, he kind of sealed the deal at the end. But going back to Smith for a second before I address the point guard situation, uh, I just thought more so than anything else he did yesterday down the wire when Delaware had a shot to cut it to one or tie it up, it was it was Sticks who blocked the shot, altered the shot three times in a row, and put the game away. Point guard situation. Yes, he did have more alterations than a seamstress down the stretch there. Well put. Down the stretch, all right, down the stretch, uh, and throughout the game, I was extremely impressed by uh, Scott Green's favorite player, Scott Green from Rivals, and that's Eric Eric Aiello. And he was everything Scott's been talking about to me, and he just has that poise of a guy— you gotta remember, he's just a freshman, and he had the poise making the right passes, and he was just did everything right. Now he learned, he learned that it's not as easy to drive the bucket when you get to D one. He reminds me of Deron Williams, who used to play at Illinois. Right, tough guy, tough, tough guy. guy. Go ahead, um, Mason. You're he's just a basketball player, right? And that's something that I believe Maryland's lacked is guys that can just they're just basketball players. They don't really play a position. They can drive they can shoot they can he's that guy he's that i'm going to put him in the game and he's just a ball player well bruce brought up and we can talk about it here his patience the pace that he plays talking about eric he Ayala. slows everything down but he's still fast in other words he had some plays. he threw a couple passes to jalen smith he threw a couple passes to jalen smith that were just special maybe he didn't finish him or whatever but uh, as the season goes on, I think we're going to see uh, maybe a lot more of him at the one and uh, Cowan at the two. I think Cowan can attack very well off the edge. Of course, Turgeon in the post game said something that was true last night. Down the stretch, Delaware was terrific. They cut a 22 point lead into manageable chunks. And if it had ended a little differently, could have actually gotten it to tie it up. But Smith. Uh, Sticks alters the end of the game, and Maryland gets away with it. Mason? Yeah, one more thing is, and you mentioned it, that Smith didn't really finish, is Maryland had that problem last year where people were just trying to throw the ball too hard down. It it was still there last night. The missed passes down low, the missed dunks down low, the missed layups. Like That needs to change. That that's one of those defining moments when you get layups or free throws, which Maryland missed both of in this game, and they don't go in the basket. Those are just things you have to improve on. Aaron Wiggins started the game, wound up, uh, had seven rebounds, seven points, but he's got to do better than one for eight for the field. And, of course, he is a freshman, so I, we're going to give him a pass. But the team overall was two for 19 from the three-point line. Now, if that doesn't improve, it's it's not going to be uh, – it's, it's going to be a long, long season. But – you know, they, were, they missed every, I'm telling you what, they were up out of that two for 19, there was probably about eight air balls. Oh, they, there wasn't a shot they didn't like early on. The freshmen it's made funny, sure they Morcel got their shots. Morcel hit his first. Yep. And then it was like, I don't know who hit the second one, but Morcel hit the first, and that was uh, that was on the money. Let's see who hit it. Wiggins. Uh, Wiggins hit one. Right. That was also early. All right. So, Mason, you, you got your pulse, the pulse of the younger generation, a heck of a lot better than we do. Weren't a whole lot of students at the game last night, a little low on the attendance. What do you think Maryland has to do to get some more peeps to show up at those games? It's all about winning. I mean, especially with Maryland basketball, it's all about winning. 
Sure, good opponents will always put people in the seats, but if you win, as we saw when they had Diamond Stone and Mello and Suleiman, people are going to be there. And it's and basketball. They'll be there for basketball no matter what. Well, last year that was no, that just but wasn't they, true. The scheduling last year was not good. And uh, there were so many games during the break. Don't they? When's school over? Like the first week of December or something? Probably the second week in December. Yeah, I don't know how it works, but there are still five games in that gap, and people are just not going to drive back 100 miles to see us play Hofstra. Okay. Or well, Radford. I mean, it's just true. the way it is. I thought there were more people excited about Maryland basketball than showed up. I think the crowd up. was that bad. What was the announced attendance? W- without Zach, uh, the Zach Balno, who used to be the SID, running around with his piece of paper with the attendants written on it. I, I didn't see it. Right. I, I looked to be, we'll be look about, it up. what, eight, nine, ten thousand, something like that? Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't as bad. bad. It wasn't that bad. It, I just want the students to show up on a Wednesday night first game. The team's pretty good. It wasn't that bad. It that was be- yeah, yeah. That was better than some of the conference games last year that weren't during the break. That, that's all I'll leave. That's what I'll put it at. Yeah. All right. So right. we'll move on from that. That, that. that story's getting old anyway, with certainly with football. But uh, I just uh, I like the way they look. It's awful early. You guys uh, got the big game against Navy on Friday. I have no idea what Navy presents, but I know when you play in Hall, is it Halsey oh. Hall? I believe it no, is. No, it's Alumni Hall. Alumni oh. Hall? Okay. I don't know why I thought it was Halsey Hall. That might be the... Uh, Maybe that's the name of the media, whatever the media booth. But well, that Davy Arena is not a big arena, you know. No. It really isn't, and uh, you're, it, it's a fun place to go to. It's a fun place for basketball. And you said to make sure that I understood that just because we're playing Navy, this is no gimme. This is no gimme. Why? So because because it's it's a, a ferocious road crowd. I mean, the, the midshipmen, and the one thing about when you play a team like Navy is you always get their best, always. You never get a team that's going to take a day off. You, you don't, Navy doesn't, you know, come, you know, half the time, which is why over the years, I don't know if you remember it, uh, Wayne, or Mason probably doesn't remember it, but they had a Final Four team one time, all right, with I, David I, Robinson. Can you believe that? I don't, don't look at me like that. They had a Final Four team. Okay, I'm looking at you like that. I don't think they Wayne, made it all the way. The, all Wayne, right, take your word for they it. They had a Final Four team when David Robinson was there. They lost the first game of the Final Four. and uh, But my point is, with David Robinson, and over the years they've had different people, they were fantastic. And you get into that environment, you don't know what could happen. It's just like if I said to you, we're going to play... At Towson. We're going to play at Delaware. I mean, do you think those games would be locks? No. No. I mean, we've we've seen, uh, certainly, you can't say anything that UMBC has involved with it, that they're uh, locks. UMBC, the biggest upset in the world. And, you know, when you talked about mid-majors with Todd Holden yesterday, he, he brought up some ge- decent points. You can see that on the Terp Talk postgame show up on TerpTalk.com. What did you take from what Todd Holden, who played on the 2002 National Championship well, team? Well, he just said that so many guys in D1, and he's gone back 20 years now, but so many guys in, D1, in, in the mid-major D1 mm-hmm. just were not good enough to make you know the top-tier teams. And they just were not good enough. But you watch a guy like this guy Carter yesterday— could he play for anybody? I mean, there's no it question about like it. It like uh, yes. We're just looking at some stats. Okay. Well, maybe I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, right. 1986. They, they um, did Elite play, Eight. Yeah. And they lost Elite to Duke, 71-50. to um, Some more notes on Navy. They start their season off with a 67-44 to loss to Old Dominion. They play in Alumni Hall, which is 8,700. 8, Capacity, so it's about the size of the Miami Arena. Yeah, and the, that Miami Arena is never full. Mason, are there tickets available for Friday night, eight thirty, in Annapolis? My bad, I got the um, capacity wrong. It's five thousand seven ten. Uh, I thought it was smaller. I thought it was smaller. It's not a big arena whatsoever. It's probably 
uh, similar to uh, Towson's new arena. I'm not sure what they hold. Well, it, it's going to be fun, and I know you'll be calling from the road going, what's it like, what's it like? Yeah, no, it'll be, it's a great atmosphere. And, I love, and you know, you look at some of these other mid-major games he has. When you play a mid-major, you really don't know what's going to happen, all right? You don't know what you're going to face. And uh, we don't do enough of it, but I'd love to see Turgeon go to UMBC and help Chris in that building. All right? I really would, but he won't. I remember when Maryland went to Mount St. Mary's up past Frederick when they opened what's now the, well, it was the Knot Arena at that time. Rudy Archer had the best night he had in his entire Maryland career. Have you ever been out there? Uh, we've been there. I haven't been to a game there, but I've, I've been we, to a game there. I went the to arena. see when Patsos was hot. I went out to see Towson one time. He asked me to come, and I, and I went. That's another nice arena. Yeah. Middle I, of I, nowhere. I mean the middle of nowhere, yeah. literally. Right. Yeah. Well, it just passed nowhere. Yeah, it is. If you go, over. if you drive a little further, there's some sea monsters, and then you fall off the map. So, uh, real quick, while we're talking hoops, did either of you guys get to see any of Duke last night? No, but the whole world's heard about it. Oh my lord! I TV'd the game, and they were up. I think they were up at 27 to Kentucky. I don't know what the final was, but they're, they're, it's a joke that this guy is playing. It was Zion Williams. Zion Williams. I said it's eight months ago when I first saw him. He does not belong in the NCAA. And if Duke doesn't win the national championship or at least play in it. 118-84 finals, what the score was. This is Kentucky, 118-84. to 84. Jesus, what's that? It's 30 points almost. Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's 30. 34 30, points. 34. Yeah, something like that. It's Kentucky. But you understand. Anybody they put on Zion is a mismatch. There is no way to guard him. He's that much better. It's like it would be like putting LeBron when he was eighteen into college. It would have been ridiculous. Well, know, we'll like see. It was with Melo. We'll All see right? how they call these games because usually guys in college, because of the way the refs call the games, the refs seem to even this stuff out a bit. And if he stays healthy, they won't lose a game because they. Besides having the best player in the country, they got two, three, and five. On the starting yeah, line. Reddish and R.J. Barrett. Yeah, yeah Barrett. Cameron Cameron Reddish was uh, picking between well, Maryland and yeah, Duke. Yeah, last night you did get a preview of the um, what could have been Maryland's with Keldon Johnson on uh, Kentucky, Reddish on Duke. I mean, th- yeah, so, that was what Turgeon was chasing. And they didn't get those two. Maryland still has a top ten class, so I know we're up against the clock here. I'm not upset about the class at all. I, no. I'm really not. Uh, Ricky Lindo got a few minutes. I thought he looked great in the practices I've seen. He didn't look so great last night. Comments? Freshman, freshman. No, freshman. that's that's right. not quite it. From what we heard on the podcast from Dave Lamonico and Scott Green, when we were talking about Lindo, it was well down low. He's not there. He's not. He's not a down low power forward. He might be able to stretch the four, maybe, maybe. But for Maryland right now, with Bender still seemingly getting healthy, he's going to have to go play the four, especially right. if Bruno's in trouble. And Sorrell Smith, where's number 10? He got a few minutes. Anything? Not too impressive. Not too impressive last night. Rotation uh, guy. Rotation guy. Tomajic got a few minutes, and you already mentioned Bender. Tomajic looked good in his three minutes. Yeah, he I was okay. He, he looked okay. I've always been a guy that really wants Tomajic to get more time, but... If he's not showing in practice, well, then he's not going to get the time in the he game. He has to play because it's either him or Bender. When you get in foul trouble in these bigger games against bigger opponents, Maryland ends the game, I think, with Morsell playing power forward again. Look, I don't think so. Sticks. Both, don't of think them, so. They, both of those two guys can play. That's, There's no doubt about it. They're not great. Bender and Tamayas. Bender and Tamayas. But they certainly can provide you a spark. They'll play well at home. Oh, we're way past the break. All right, we'll be back. A lot more to talk about. Talk some Ravens in the next segment with Dennis. And then we'll uh, look at the football squad and what's coming up. Probably our last chance to become bowl eligible uh, in reality on Saturday against IU, a pick em game. Mason will provide his expertise on that one. Back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Welcome back to Coons Ford Terp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. It's the same old song with a different beat since you've been gone. With that, we'll introduce Dennis Kalatsis to talk about the same old Ravens. What in the world happened on Sunday, Dennis? 
Well, when they were four and two, uh, Eric Weddle assured us that we were watching a different team and not the same old Ravens, Bruce. But ever since that speech uh, after beating Pittsburgh, uh, it's very much the same old Ravens. And maybe he was right. It's not the same old Ravens. There, there may be. They may even be worse than the same old Ravens because right now, jobs are very much at stake. The head coach, the coaching staff, the quarterback, uh, all the veterans, Weddle and Jimmy Smith and Terrell Suggs, and maybe they don't even extend C.J. Mosley. So lots of things are up in the air uh, by the virtue of the losing streak. The Ravens are now 4-5, and five, uh, Dennis, heading into the bye week with pretty much little hope of making the playoffs, mainly because it, the Steelers own the turf right now. Is there any way they could make the playoffs? Or would it take – see, Steelers have a tough schedule, but that's about what it would take. Well, you never say never, but at this point, uh, things look very, very bleak. Um, you know, they, they dug themselves into a hole. They've lost to the Saints, the Panthers, and the Steelers. And you know what dawned on me this morning, Bruce, was that they were favored by two or three points in all of these three games. So they had full Vegas, uh, even Vegas, into thinking that they were better than what they were. And the problem is still the offense. They have enough defense to win. I mean, the, look, let's face it, you're not going to get a defense like 2,000 uh, to come up again and I mean, I think the defense is good enough with the way that the rules favor the offense these days. But you know, the problem begins with the quarterback. You know, Joe Flacco, uh, he, you know, he panics. Uh, he, he determines pre-snap where that ball is going. He doesn't go through progressions. You know, people are saying, you know, he, uh, he missed Lamar Jackson on purpose. No, he never – Lamar Jackson was his fifth read on that play. So he never got there. He, in a pre-snap, he determined he was going to Smokey Brown was double covered. Uh, because he knows he's missing three of his five starting offensive linemen, so that you know he's same old Joe. Well, that's what I was going to bring up. The, I'll take a team forty miles the other way on the road, up the road, says they they lost three starting linemen. They lose the game. They say, "Oh, how can you win a game without these linemen?" The Ravens lose three starting linemen and go, "Oh, Joe Flacco's horrible." It's a different team with the starting offensive line, except but maybe, for one thing. You know, you were the guy who texted me. How could Joe not have seen? Uh, Lamar Jackson. Yeah, we talked about after the it, game. Dennis, it was ridiculous. He was standing there by himself. Well, but again, that, but again, that's Joe not scanning the field. Joe's not a field general. He's just a thrower. And look, he you know he needs a real he needs a running game with a stout offensive line to to have confidence to plant his feet and go through progressions. Right now, he's very nervous. He doesn't want to get hurt again, and he just gets rid of that ball very quickly. And it doesn't matter whether the receiver is double or triple cover, he's not going to go through his progressions. He's just not. And uh, it's his performance and the offense. I mean, since 2008, they're 19 and 56 and scoring 21 points or, or less. Okay, that's not the defense. That's the offense. It's ridiculous that they – look, they, the Steelers scored 23 points. Uh, you're at home. You're supposed to score more points than that. They, they, they laid an egg on the road against the Panthers. And again, they didn't score enough points against the Saints. That's why they're four and five, going nowhere for the fourth straight season in a row. So, looking just down the stat line from the beginning of the season to now, the stats from the Ravens' offense have just plummeted. Flacco, at points in this season, was throwing for over 300 yards. Over the past two weeks, we've seen 192 and 206 back to back. You could blame the receivers all you want last year, but at this point, who's it on, Dennis? Uh, it, it, it's on Flacco, and and you know what? I think that uh, Harbaugh is going to go down with him. I just, you know, I I was pounding the table for Lamar Jackson at halftime against the Steelers, and the same thing against the Panthers because one thing for sure, and I, and I tweeted this out at halftime. I said Joe's not bringing him back in either game. He's not going to bring him back once this team gets in a hole. This quarterback will not bring him back. He's too predictable. Now, you got the Bengals coming in. Marvin Lewis has, has beaten the tar out of, out of Joe Flacco over the last 15 seasons. I mean, it's, although Joe's been there for 11. But uh, he has the Ravens numbered because he knows how to play Flacco. He zones him up. Uh, he knows that, that Joe's going to make a mistake. He's not patient. And he'll throw for an interception or two. And this is how the Bengals beat us every time. They've had, they have two weeks now, in my opinion, to get Lamar Jackson ready. Put him in the game, and let's see what the kid can do. Well, right? he, I think he, it's his time. I have a question for Bruce. When the Ravens put Flacco on the field with a bad knee against the Bengals at the end, was it three years ago? And eventually he hurts his knee, and he has to 
go through a surgical procedure and so forth. And when he came back, you said it's not the same guy. He doesn't have the same. Is that the point at which he became the guy that Dennis just described? Yeah, I think that the injury, he's never been the same since the injury, Dennis. Would you agree there? Well, you know what? I, I, I think, look, looking back at since 2012, the guy had four phenomenal games, right? 11 touchdowns, zero interceptions in the, in the Super Bowl. Uh, to me, he hasn't been the same since he signed up a contract. <laughs> I mean, he just got fat and happy and, you know, making $25 million a year guaranteed. Um, I don't know how much drive or desire, you know, he has. Uh, when Gary Kubiak was here in 2014, uh, he and Rick Dennison had a beat on him just to work on his mechanics. He, he just doesn't work. He just doesn't put the work in that the great ones put in, your, your Brady's, your, your Rogers, uh, your Breeze. He just doesn't do that, right? He's just a different kind of a cat. He's got a big arm, and that's about it. He, you know, he doesn't have a lot of awareness on the field, uh, uh, doesn't read coverages real well. I mean, he's just a thrower. And it's just a shame that uh, we've reached this point, and it's going to cost, you know, and rightfully so, it's going to cost the, the head coach his job because it's his job to make sure he gets the right people uh, to do the right things in the field. And, but, I don't, again, I don't know how, how he can get Flacco to perform better. No, I, I'm not sure either. But, look, another underthrow to Mark Andrews early. He missed a wide-open Lamar Jackson, then he underthrew Eric Crabtree. Crabtree, right. Those are throws that he should have made. And, you know, we, you're trading field goals for touchdowns against the Pittsburgh Steelers with, that have one of the most prolific offenses in the NFL, even without Le'Veon Bell. And also what bothered me the most in that game was that last drive by Big Ben. He just punched our lights out with those quick passes. And what do you make, three straight third downs? Nobody makes three straight third downs. Well, I, again, it, it doesn't just- happen. With the way that the, the rules are in the NFL that favor the offense, uh, you've got to take advantage of those. Look at your top four teams. You've got, you've got the Patriots, you've got the Chiefs, you've got the Rams, and you've got the, the Saints, right? They all have great running games, right? Look at the running backs in those teams. Uh, the quarterbacks, the receivers, it's a, it's a scoring league. Uh, the, the league wants to see 48-45. They want to see uh, you know, 45-42. That's how they're built. That's how they're designed. They're not designed... To, to go 12 and 9 anymore or your 6 and 3 games. And uh, look, the Ravens have enough defense, they have enough special teams. Where they've been missing the boat has been the offense. And every year, Joe doesn't have weapons. Well, this year he's got weapons, but he doesn't have an offensive line. All the more reason to put the more mobile quarterback back there, let him run around and see what he can do because this quarterback is not going to run around. Well, look, if, if the Ravens can't beat Cincinnati next week, and I'm not sure why we're going to think they're going to beat them. If they can't beat Cincinnati, then I'll tell you one thing that's going to happen. You've seen the last of Joe. Because well, you know, and, and the other part of it is, do I really want him to put the rookie quarterback in there and ruin him, perhaps, for you know, maybe ruin his career by putting him back there, right? Or do they just ride it out with Flacco and make the change in 2019? I'm hearing that uh, Gruden, uh, John Gruden in Oakland, he likes quarterbacks. Uh, he's got three first-round draft picks in 2019. I'm sure he would give one of them up for Joe Flacco because the Raiders, Although they gave uh, Derek Carr a big contract, they've got about eighty-three million dollars in cap space next year, so they can they can they can afford to sign a Flacco. You know, I'd be thrilled if they got a first-round draft pick for Flacco because you've got Lamar Jackson on his rookie contract. Now's the time the Ravens are going to have a lot of cap space in the next few years. Now's the time you can get the guy some pieces, and hopefully, you know, he can get something going here in Baltimore. Well, it was a rough weekend last weekend, Dennis, between Michigan State and uh, the yeah. Steelers, but the Steelers game was a killer because it kind of ruined the season. Maryland still got another crack this week to get their sixth win, but we'll see and, what and happens. Speaking, and, and speaking of the Steelers, I mean, you know, the, the team I didn't think was aggressive. They never went for it on fourth down. Uh, I, I, you know, I thought they, they should have been playing for their lives, but if you, if you turn the TV on in the fourth quarter, you, you would have thought the Ravens were leading because it was so casual in their approach. I just didn't think... Uh, they played to win. I thought the Steelers came in and handled their business, but uh, there was still, was still a one-score game. All right. I mean, it's, it's At the, the end same of the story. day, two red zone <laughs> failures was the difference of the game, and uh, and that's what it is. Still the same story. Same that's old song, as in. I said. Hey, I've just brought up the Coons Ford website, and something jumps off the Coons Ford of Baltimore website, which is over 2 million vehicles sold and counting. That's you guys have sold two million vehicles there. That's the Coons family. Wow. Yeah, I I asked Mr. Coons this morning how close we're to three million, so he told me he'll find out for me. <laughs> We've got to be getting close to three million. So we're you know we're we, we like selling vehicles. We like putting uh, cars in people's driveways. 
What's what's new now? I'm sure your 18s are almost gone, and uh, you probably have a few left. But it's now like the 19 season now, correct? Yeah, 19s are starting to come in. We still have plenty of of, of 18s, and it's uh, it's truck season and uh, commercial vehicle season, and uh, a lot of uh, business owners. Uh, there's a thing called Section 179.org. You can write up the million dollars worth of inventory uh, automotive purchases. So folks need to check with their accountants. But right now we're seeing a, a big uptick in, uh, in vans, commercial vans, and also the big trucks, uh, F-150s, 250s, 350s. They're moving very fast. We also have the 2019 Ford Ranger. That's coming back. We'll have some of those in February of 2019. Uh, and also the big Bronco in, the, in this, this summer. Do you find with the booming economy that we're having experiencing right now, Businesses are buying a lot more trucks. Is that why you got about 800 of them in stock, it seems? Yeah, I mean, look, they're building uh, contracts, they're building, uh, people are buying houses, they're building houses, they're buying land, uh, they're feeling good about the economy, and then certainly, you know, construction's way, way up, building permits are way, way up, and that, that of course, impacts our industry, and uh, we're, we're booming, and one of my uh, bank reps called today and said, man, you guys are selling us a lot of business, of course, it's uh, people are buying vehicles. And, it's the, money's it, and the money's there to loan out, isn't it? For sure, no, they're giving they're giving money. The rates are still low. The Fed's going to uh, increase the rates at some point, but still, it's still cheap money. Bruce, when I got into business in 1988, uh, a good interest rate was twelve percent. Yeah, uh, it sure yeah. was. It sure yeah, was. All right, Dennis. Uh, tomorrow, of course, you'll be on the Sunday Sports Voice down the dial. I'll be on as u- I'll be on as usual at four thirty, and uh, we'll delve deeper into the Ravens and the rest of the NFL. And has Des Bryant signed with the Saints yet? Yes, he has. He's officially a saint. That is official. Boy, if anybody's not a saint, it's Des, well, uh, Des Bryant, who is a saint. <laughs> How's that work out for you? How's that work out for the Saints? What do you think? Uh, I think it's a. I think it's a great move. I mean, the Saints are playing. To, they're playing for keeps. They're playing for the uh, the home field advantage throughout the playoffs in the NFC. And look, I, I envision the Saints Ram shootout. It was eighty points last week. It was great to watch the second half. Uh, the Saints were up thirty-five seventeen, and I was curious to see how. McVeigh would bring back the Rams, and he did. It was a 45-35 game. That's what we need to see here in Baltimore. We need to see some scoring, a gentleman, which we haven't seen in a long, long time. Dennis, thanks a lot for coming on, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. Go Ravens, go Terps. All right. All right. This is Bruce Posner. We'll be back here in a few minutes on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Take a closer look at Maryland's football team and uh, might squeeze in a couple uh, points on the soccer team and field hockey. Field hockey. Hold it. Uh, you know, everybody's on a run for the playoffs right now, and the football teams need to get into that cycle. Uh, be back in a few moments. This is Coons Ford Term Talk. Call 410 481 1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. So we have some unusual news to report. But first, let's go officially. A new Board of Regents president. Wayne, tell us real quick. Linda Gooden takes over as the chairman of the Board of Regents of the University System of Maryland. Um, I wonder if she's the first uh, female president of the Board of Regents. I can do some research on this, but this is relatively breaking news late afternoon when we're on in time early for Turp Talk. Just in, in time, time for, for Turp Talk. Talk. And they uh, let uh, Wes Robinson go? Mason? Ro- yeah. yeah. Robinson and Nordwell yeah, are both, gone. Both gone as of last night. And uh, in other news, uh, Marcus Lewis, a transfer cornerback from Florida State, uh, didn't work out at Maryland, according to Keith Cavanaugh on Terrapin Times. Oh. And he he was playing a lot. He wore number eight on defense. Of course, number eight on offense is Fleet. But uh, number eight on defense is Marcus Lewis. He was the starting cornerback for most of the season. You haven't seen him for the last three games. He's no longer part of the team. Hey, you know, speaking of guys who transferred in, uh, I think the Byron Coward uh, experiment has worked out very well. I mean, I was really impressed with the play he made last week, even though, even though he fumbled. But the guy was trying to get a touchdown. It was, he was. It was desperation time. Right. And, I never fault the guy for that. I really don't. I think he's played fairly well. Everybody knows that's the guy you got to stop in the defensive line for Maryland. He gets a little extra attention, but he's played fairly well. I think he's the best defensive lineman Maryland had. Now, I know a lot of people say there's not much talk about with this football game. And in many ways, that's true. But I want to bring this down, since it's Wednesday and this game happens Saturday, to two plays. I want both of you to, to chime in here. In the third quarter... Uh, Maryland was still in the game. Uh, Michigan State had a 10 on the board. 
They get the ball about to the one-yard line. They're trying to score, and the tailback fumbles from Michigan State into the end zone. The ball bounces around. A Michigan State lineman falls on the ball. Touchdown. They go to video review. The running back did not cross the line with the ball under control. It was a fumble, and the fumble was recovered by Michigan State. Maryland's down 17-3. to If that ball bounces the other way, it's still 10-3. to No doubt. It bounced Michigan State's way. They get a touchdown. Well, I'm going to fast forward to the play you just talked about. Byron Coward intercepts the ball about the 20-yard line off a tip pass. He runs inside the one-yard line when he is stripped from behind by a Michigan State wide receiver who made a heck of a play to chase that down. Coward fumbles into the end zone. The ball bounces around. Michigan State falls on that ball. It's a touchback. Two plays right there. Total 14 points difference. That's he, when you're going bad, though. I mean, that's it does. But when they say when when people go, oh, of course this game didn't come down to two plays, lost 24 to three. The next play was an 80 yard touchdown. Next play is it right, which doesn't happen if Maryland scores. So I'm just saying that when somebody says this game, even though it ended 24 to three, there are two plays where the ball was thrown on the ground, it bounced around like a football here's, does. But here's and the Maryland problem. Got neither one week. of them. Here's the problem last week. We really can't fault the defense. They played hard. They played strong. Uh, Trey Watson, once again, played well. But you can't move the ball 100 yards over a course of a game at home and think you're going to win. you got problems. But I'm still telling you, that ball bounces left instead of right right. twice. We're in the game. Didn't say we're going to win it. Mason, this weekend, field hockey, playing to get into the final four, two games at home, and soccer, their semifinal game in the Big Ten tournament. I think they've just about sealed the bid to the to the big dance because of the uh, their uh, difficulty of schedules off the charts. Tell us about those two events. Well, we'll start with the one that is on Friday. Maryland will take on Indiana at one. It's a tough game. Yeah, Indiana's number one, number three in the country, or seven. They're their top five team. Yeah, it's one of the only games that this year that Maryland has lost by a considerable amount. The defense this year led by Dane St. Clair, has just been fantastic. Um, if they win this one, they could be on pace to actually get a home game in the NCAA tournament. Uh, Donovan Pines, not too bad. Where's number two? He's a tall guy in the back line. Scored, he scored some own goals this year. Just things have gone wrong for this team. The ball has bounced the wrong way well, quite bro- a few times. One bright sign is, is this guy, Ben, B-I-N. He's been great. I mean, he's he's uh, the games they've won, he scored the big goal, and... Uh, Maybe they're coming on. I, I don't know. But Maybe. Uh, it was a big win the other day. Right. Yeah, they've they finished strong this year. Okay. And hockey um, is... Well, yeah, the, this is the Todd Carton moment here. Field hockey. Right. Well, Todd can't get on tonight, but uh, uh, field hockey's playing Albany the first game on Friday. Yeah. If, if they win that, there's another home game on Sunday. Yep. Tremendous edge. And if you win both of them, then you get to the Final Four. And their bracket, I thought, was an advantage. Three Big Ten teams in the final, you know, in the final 16. It's pretty impressive. Penn State and Rutgers uh, are also in it. But, you know, I like my chances with Missy, and I love the fact that if they did get to the championship game, it's highly likely they'd be playing an unbeaten Connecticut team. And you know how I feel about them. Well, no, no. They just lost? Connecticut's the four seed. Maryland could be playing Connecticut as soon as Sunday. So it's Do you Maryland have to look at brackets. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, why would that Maryland? Why would both those games be at home this weekend? Because well, Maryland beat Connecticut earlier this year at UConn when UConn. Well, then was who's number, number one? Who, oh, North, North Carolina. Carolina. Yeah, they're unbeaten. That's the team I want to play. That's the team I'd like to play. If you're going to beat somebody, at least beat Carolina. We have to beat them in Kentucky. But right now, Mason, tell us about Indiana and tell us why the Terps have a good shot at this game. Although after last Saturday, it's hard to think that. But North Carolina is not Michigan State. I mean, uh, neither is Indiana. 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 Neither's Indiana. Indiana is neither. Right. We'll get our GPS so, out. If you- what GPS in North <laughs> Carolina? You, <laughs> they have a GPS. The athletes have GPS. They, they if might. you if you look at this game, Maryland's played poorly against your Michigan States, your Iowas of the world. But then it seems like every other week they come back against that lower tier Big Ten team, your Minnesota, your Rutgers, your uh, Illinois, and they absolutely blow them out. So this game it does look appealing for Maryland. The only thing is it's on the road, and this team is. Not been great on the road. Yeah, but it'll be on the road with a kind of like Maryland type crowd. I mean, it'll be uh, thirty thousand and similar in, kind of like uh, ambiance. Yeah, the, or lack thereof. Right, you, Mason, you you track Indiana around because 
You well, they compete. Always, they compete. That's that's where Maryland's. I wouldn't say next step because Indiana's been held out of bowl games. They they lose the game that they need to win almost every year to make a bowl. But when they take the field against your Ohio State, your Michigan, the good years of Michigan State, they compete. They compete hard. And I remember a game two years ago that went to overtime against Michigan State or the college football kickoff last year against Ohio State where it was tied at 21. They're just that much better than Maryland at competing against these good teams. And it it's still kind of up in the air of why Maryland gets blown out 63-3 to when Indiana's competing. That's... That's why I like Indiana's because they they put up a fight. They come out every week. They play hard. But will Maryland be able to run the ball against Indiana? Yes, they should definitely be able to run the ball against Indiana. Indiana is coming off the bye week. Before that, they lost probably their most disappointing. And it was close to a must win game for Indiana against Minnesota. They lost thirty eight to thirty one. The thing that I don't like is Peyton Ramsey for Indiana. He's been rotating along with another guy that name escapes me at the moment. But Scott. They run the ball with the quarterback, and Maryland is bad at containing a running quarterback. And you saw that last week when Brian Lewerke, who's a injured player, he was playing injured, was running all over Maryland. And Bruce, we were talking about in the press box, Maryland just they can't contain the quarterback. No, they have taken some bad rush angles. Uh, if you said as good as Cowart's play, there were a couple plays where he took an inside angle on a quarterback who ran outside the hash marks and ran right by him. So you have to adjust yeah. your attack angles. When you're also talking about the quarterback run against Maryland this year, and we've seen it time and time again in important moments and times where the game's even over, Maryland runs a one-man blitz play where everyone's going to take on a man, shift it one direction or the other, and then they're going to have, generally, it's Antoine Brooks run straight through the gap they create and sack the quarterback. Well, I... Cannot remember at this time a time where that play has worked. Recently. Re- it might even be the whole season. Oh, he's tip passes. He's gotten in well, the way. Tip, okay, I'm talking about when he gets his two hands on the quarterback and can't bring him to the ground. That's been the line for not Watson, but it's been Isaiah Davis, Rayvon Davis, and Antoine Brooks. When you run that play, you don't have any contain. There isn't much of a backup plan when you run a one-man blitz and the guy gets two hands on the quarterback and the quarterback then runs for 20 yards. No, that's the guy who should be on the spy. He should be between the hash marks. And when you commit him to the blitz, if they pick him up, that leaves a huge gap in the middle. Yeah, I'm looking at Indiana. They're just about done. They're four and five. And and after Maryland, they got, got to go to Michigan and then play Purdue. I wouldn't call them done. Win on Saturday and then a rivalry game against Purdue. Yeah, they got a okay. prayer, I guess. Uh, what's that? The bucket game? What's that? What's that game? You ooh, should know. I, I don't. Know. I don't even know that one. Yeah, well, I'll give them the Oaken Bucket, but I think in Minnesota has it's, something it's to do with that. It's not the Oaken Bucket. It's not the Oaken Bucket. Um, All right, real quick, we're at, running out of time. I want to go through a couple of these games with uh, with Mason. First of all, who do you like in the Maryland game? I like Maryland, and I think uh, it's a good look for Vegas. Maryland's a strong favorite, especially on the money line. That's that pick of Michigan State last week was very shaky. I mean, of Maryland against Michigan State. It was shaky. That wasn't my pick. My designated pick was Michigan against Penn State. And I told you. I told you they're laying 42 on he them. He did. Yeah. He did say 42, and they got the 42. You did. I'll give you that. You hit that one. Let's just look at one other game that's a big game to me, and that's uh, Ohio State and Michigan State. Ohio State's laying three points at Michigan State. Is Ohio State and, and uh, Dwayne Haskins on the downtrod? Yes, I would put them on the down try at this point. Nebraska goes into the shoe almost beats and them. almost beat them. Now, Michigan State is a game where there will be no doubt Ohio State will be ready to play. But the three points, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. Michigan State, to me, last week, even though they won by 21 points, we just went over this, did not look good. It looked horrible, if you ask me. I mean, I, to me, they had no offense. They made mistakes. Yeah, I mean, I you but know. Ohio I State, I, I really don't know. I, I just... Would, I got to take Ohio State. We're out of time. And uh, Wayne, give me a final score. Maryland and Indiana. Maryland's run game. They're going to run the same plays they ran last week. This week, they're going to work. Maryland gets over 300 yards on the ground and takes this one 31 20. I, I think Maryland's going to win the game and get to that bowl, and they'll carry Matt Cannon off the field, which he will deserve. Pour some uh, Gatorade over his head, and uh, and he'll freeze solid in Yankee Stadium for the right. pinstripe ball, or or the sl- <laughs> What's it called in Detroit? The ta- no, no, that's a quick, quick lane, lane ball. That's a, they're not going to the quick lane ball. Can guarantee it right now. Texas heart of uh, Texas heart, ball, heart of Dallas. There you I go. doubt it. Um, 
Tax Slayer or Pinstripe? Tax Slayer is not Tax a great. Slayer would be great. It's not a great bowl anymore. Oh, but any bowl, okay. Day. Okay. any bowl is great. We were just talking about this, but six and six Penn State made the Tax Slayer Bowl a few years ago, so wouldn't put it in doubt. We're out of time, guys. Uh, thanks a lot for coming in today. Thanks a lot for listening. Go Terps. Big game against Navy on, on Friday. And we will be back on Saturday morning for Science and Kirk. I mean, for Coos Ford presents the Sports Maven. Thank you.